Diana Butu is a research fellow at Harvard University and a former legal advisor for the PLO. In this installment of Palestine Studies TV, she discusses President Obama's May 2011 speech on the Middle East and North Africa. You are watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm Willie Yeomans. Joining us today to discuss President Obama's speech is Diana Butu. Thank you for being on the show, Diana. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Was there anything new or strikingly important about the comments that President Obama made today about Israel and Palestine? Yes, actually, well, there were quite a few comments that he made that uh, that are both new and alarming. Um, the first is that he went out of his way to talk about self-determination for the rest of the Arab world, but was very specific in excluding the term self-determination when it came to Palestine. But beyond that, he also said a number of things um, that that are a shift from, from the original Obama position. First was that he didn't call for a settlement freeze, even though he had made this the cornerstone of his presidency as regards uh, Palestine. The second is that he very clearly came out on side of the Israelis and indicated that, uh, that there would not be support for um, the declaration of statehood in September. He also came out and again on side with with uh, with the Israelis and said that that the the new Palestinian unity government would ha would have to answer what it ca what he called legitimate uh, questions as regards their position, particular, particularly given the recognition of Israel, but fail to recognize that Israel has never recognized Palestine. And lastly, um, he attempted to, he's now attempting to parse away the, uh, the negotiations by turning it into a very piecemeal negotiation where you first focus on borders and security and then leave all of the other issues to a later date. And this is the policy that uh, the Israelis have been pushing for a very long period of time. So in total, uh, the speech actually is a, a very much a shift away from the original Obama position uh, that was taken very early on in his administration. Now, in regards to the issue of 1967 borders, uh, the New York Times kind of made a big deal about uh, that element of the speech. A senior administration official, and I'm quoting the New York Times here, said that uh, Mr. Obama's advisors remain deeply divided over whether he should formally endorse Israel's pre-1967 borders as a starting point for negotiations with the Palestinian state. Uh, why is this an issue when it seemed to be kind of the consensus understanding of how things would proceed for so long, or has it been? Well, look, the, I think that this is just spin on the part of the Obama administration, because if you actually look back at the Clinton parameters or if you look at the uh, Bush position, it was the same position. Uh, they didn't they didn't say 1967 borders, but they said everything else. But they said, for example, in the 2004 letter, the April 2004 letter from President Bush to Ariel Sharon, he uh, specifically talks about U.N. Security Council Resolution 242 and 338 and indicates that there will not be a return to the 1949 armistice lines um, and, and talks about mutually agreed borders. Uh, same with the, the Clinton parameters. They talk about the percentage of the West Bank, which is divide, de decided on the basis of the 67 borders. So there's nothing really new in, in anything that he said by using the term 1967 borders. I think that um, all that he's saying now is that this is going to be a, a, a situation where the United States is going to continue to push forward on that. But, but in effect, he hasn't said anything different from, from his predecessors, whether it's Clinton or Bush. There seem to be two contradictory contexts if you look at the speech as a whole. Um, you could even say maybe there were two different speeches, and I think this is a point that you picked up on. On the one hand, there's Obama's, this kind of context of Obama's upcoming speech to APEC, Netanyahu's visit, and the address, the address that he's planning to make before Congress. And then you have the looming election. And then on the other hand, you have the changing regional dynamics, the protest movements, um, and kind of the Arab Spring as a whole. Where along this kind of spectrum of context does this speech fall? I think as far as um, as the, the if you're looking at it in terms of a spectrum, I, I think that it was much more geared towards um, appeasing the pro-Israel uh, lobby, 
making sure that he gets enough, uh, that this is an election year and he gets enough votes. I don't think he really addressed the what's going on in the Arab world. I found the speech to be a rather lackluster speech. He talked about the great principles of self-determination and equality and freedom, rule of law, democracy, hum and human rights. But then when it comes to the issue of Israel and Israel's treatment of Palestinians, it seems as though he completely uh, ignores all of the wonderful words that he had said earlier and clearly goes along the line of um, of trying to push this, this very hardline pro-Israel stance. Yeah, as, as a Palestinian, uh, I didn't hear anything that was that was warm. I didn't hear anything that was new. I didn't I certainly didn't hear anything that was welcoming. And instead it, it, it indicated to me that he hasn't quite understood that the Arab Spring was not just about uh, economics, that it was a question of Israel um, and 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 the role that Israel has played in the in the fact that Israel's security comes at the expense of the freedom of millions of Arabs in, in the Arab world. And I don't think that he actually picked up on that and instead tried to make it out to be uh, that these are questions of, of internal politics, questions of internal human rights, questions of, uh, of, of economy. And I actually think the Arab Spring is much more than that. And I, I think most, most people believe the Arab Spring is much more than that. When you listen to his comments about the United Nations, uh, or the strategy of the Palestinians to go to, before the United Nations to seek recognition for a state, and then you think about his comments uh, about what Hamas needs to do um, in terms of recognition of Israel's right to exist, where does this leave Palestinian leadership, especially after this um, unity agreement? Yeah, I, I think that this is going to require them to do two things. One is to rethink their strategy as regards statehood and two to rethink the broader strategy of negotiations and the reason i say this is that if you read mahmoud abbas's piece earlier this week what he makes very clear is that the reason that they're seeking statehood is not because they want to seek all of the remedies that that can flow from statehood such as being able to sue um, Israel or trying to get some treaties enforced or trying to go to the ICC or go to the ICJ, etc. But instead, he, what he says is that they're trying to seek statehood in order to strengthen their hand at negotiations. And with the United States coming forward and saying, look, we're not going to recognize you um, if you go to, to the United Nations and may actually work even against you so that other European countries um, don't recognize you then that's clearly not going to strengthen their hand at negotiations. But the, the bigger and the broader question is um, whether they should be rethinking the strategy of negotiations in and of themselves. And it's becoming increasingly clear that the Obama administration is adopting the Israeli stance as regards to negotiation, first by putting all of these preconditions that first Hamas has to recognize Israel, um, second, putting forward the other precondition of no unilateral measures. And then third, uh, doing exactly what Obama said is going to happen, which is to try to parse up the negotiations into, into different fields uh, where you first discuss borders and security arrangements and then leave everything else to the future. Um, so I think it, for the Palestinian, uh, particularly with this unity government, they should be really looking long and hard at, at coming up with a very different strategy, one that, that doesn't involve the declaration of statehood simply for the sake of, of strengthening one's hand at negotiations, and two, um, rethinking completely this idea of, of negotiations in and of themselves, uh, because that clearly that, that has not worked, and it is increasingly looking as though it's going to be more of a, condition, a situation in which um, the Israeli preconditions are required to be met before anything else can be done. So I wouldn't, for example, be surprised if the next precondition that comes up is that not only has to, there does there have to be recognition of Israel, but there has to be recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. So I think that this is the path that is is increasingly um, being that this is the path that the negotiations are going to lead towards. And I think now uh, they have the ability to revisit that strategy now that they have a national unity government and, and clearly should be revisiting that those two strategies. Do you hold out any kind of promise or do you see any potential in a second term uh, under Obama for a changed U.S. foreign policy or do you think that it's going to be a kind of continuum um, from this term to the next term? 
what I think it's important to put in line um, the way that Obama started off and where he's he's turned out. So he started off as uh, a president who who came in at a time just immediately after Israel's massacre in Gaza, who said nothing during the massacre, obviously, um, who then makes as his very first phone call, a phone call to Mahmoud Abbas, that who then comes forward very quickly and uh, condemns Israel's settlement activity and calls for a complete settlement freeze, um, who then also comes out very quickly, unlike any other president, and uh, calls for a halt to the uh, to Israel's policy of demolitions, who then comes out again and talks about, uh, speaks before Cairo um, in what many term to be a warm speech, and also appoints um, Senator Mitchell. So he comes out in terms of the first half of, of his term, he comes out very strong. But then he, he slides and very quickly he slides. He has a showdown with Obama, with uh, Netanyahu in which he loses. Uh, he no longer pushes for a settlement freeze. He then does a complete reversal in which he starts to push Netanyahu uh, to, to try to incentivize him to give him more money just to halt uh, settlement construction for a very short period of time and falls into the same trap that the Clinton administration fell into, which is process over substance and uh, and continues to to go down also the same path that Bush went down of really pandering to the to the pro-Israel lobby. So in terms of the way he started and where he's finished, we've seen we we basically saw in in his uh, two nearing three years now um, that he he did the entire gamut, the entire spectrum of of what Clinton did in eight years, he's done in a, in a period of two and a half years. So what does this mean for a second term? It depends on where he wants to where he wants to end up and what he wants his legacy to be. I'm not entirely uh, clear or certain that he's going to go back to the same way that he did two years ago. I'm not entirely certain that he wants to have another showdown with uh, Netanyahu, uh, and I'm not so sure that he's going to do that. I think instead he wants to he's going to try to be remembered as a president who who fixed things and tried to get things done. And and mo like most presidents, he's going to start focusing on domestic issues and uh, begin to neglect this issue. This is to me the path that he set out with this speech by parsing away the various elements and saying that we're first gonna focus on borders and then we'll leave the tough issues like Jerusalem and refugees to the end. Uh, it sounds to me as though he's going to look for very small um, successes if, uh, if you will have it and not really enter into a big showdown with the Israelis. Do you think that would leave room for other states or other, you know, coalitions of countries to take uh, kind of leadership on this issue away from the U.S. or is the U.S. going to sit on this for the forever? Oh, well, you know, there's always been room for other countries to come in and step in, uh, particularly during the, the second term of the, of, the, of the Bush administration. And including now, one of the things that's interesting is if you go back and read some of the quartet statements, and the statement, the, the bilateral statements as well of, uh, of, of the Europeans, et cetera, you begin to realize that, that when Obama was emboldened, they too were also emboldened. Um, and so they, so there was always this, this room for, for the Europeans, for example, to step in, but they didn't, they instead chose to have it that the United States plays the, the central role and that the United States sets the policy. Um, so there is scope there, but I just don't think that they're going to do it you know, for, for all the various reasons that the Europeans are scattered. It's a, it requires a number of countries to come together. Um, they can't really uh, agree, particularly with the presence of, of Germany, the Netherlands, and, uh, and the UK, etc. cetera. Um, so there is room there, but I just don't think that it's going to happen. Do you have any um, other insights or thoughts that you wanted to share about the speech? You know, one thing, Will, that really struck me is that he had a golden opportunity to really align uh, what he calls American values with, with American policy in the Middle East, and he squandered it. It, it was a perfect opportunity to actually set out very clearly what the United States believes in, and what policy they're going to take in the region. And instead, he continued this policy line of exceptionalism. Even if you look at just the, the, the statements as regards um, states, uh, statehood, he, and, and he's, he very clearly said that Israel's entitled to security 
um, and went to, to great lengths to talk about Israeli security and what Israel is entitled to do and started off with the premise of all states have the right to, to secure themselves and to security. But then does the flip side and talks about Palestine and makes it very clear that Palestine will be a non-militarized state. Um, so here there was a golden opportunity for the president to come forth and set out this ideal of freedom, the ideal of equality, of respect for human rights, of rule of law, democracy, etc. But instead, he, he followed the same pattern that every other president has followed through, which is there is one policy for the Middle East, and then there's a special policy as regards Israel. And that, to me, was, a, was very much a missed opportunity. Thank you very much for being on Palestine Studies TV. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Mm -hmm.